It's funny because I actually I was... met you in 2013 when I went to America. And I, yeah, we got a photo together and I took some photos of you when you were warming up, you know, if your powerlifting meet there at the Olympia. Oh, you were the one who took the picture of my back? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, dude. That's <laughs> fucking aw- I That's my favorite picture of myself ever. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, my partner. You are the oh, fucking man, picture. dude. <laughs> but it was really funny because I got off the plane that morning and the, the passport control TGA dude gave me a heap of shit because I was wearing the Chaos and Pain t-shirt. And he said, what in the holy hell does chaos and pain mean? So I sort of didn't think that through, like in wearing that t-shirt on the plane, thinking I was going to get <laughs> as much shit as I did coming through customs. But I was lucky I didn't wear the hooligan one. So I'm wearing the Hawaiian colored shirt because I, I know you usually rock, you know, the pretty bright colors on the podcast. So I just wanted to match you and not just wear like something dull and drab, like a black t-shirt or something. I love it. I love it, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. I'd like to welcome to the channel today a very special guest. He's a longtime blogger on the site, Plague of Strength. He's an author of multiple works. He's a world record holder in the squat and the progenitor of the chaos and pain training style. I'd extend a warm welcome to the one and only Jamie Lewis. How are you doing, Jamie? Hey, yo. And I am so excited to discover that you were the guy who took my epic, epic back picture where I just looked like the Hulk. It was amazing. I can't believe that was you. That's so cool. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, because one of the other things I also got that day, it was I was filming your deadlift attempt and I remember filming it and seeing your bicep basically come ripped off the bone. And (laughs) I kind of still wish I had that now, but obviously with no cloud kind of storage back then, everything got lost on these little HD cards that we had on our phones and yeah, yeah. yeah. I've lost so many videos on old phones. <laughs> yeah, don't you wish we can go back again and kind of capture a heap of uh, photos and stuff of ourselves in our younger years? Because I, I look back and I've got nothing. So I have literally nothing. Like, so I took a trip to China in 1998. My mom made this scrapbook for me. It was really cool. And when when I got a DUI, I went to jail. I the storage unit I had that book in was sold because I couldn't make the payments on it. And so I lost the scrap of all of my pictures from China, except for the one that I put on the website. So (laughs) (laughs) I actually also wanted to ask you about that. I know this is a little bit off tangent, but I remember that you, you know, you studied Asian studies, you spent some time in Asia and China, you went to Austria and you haven't really talked too much about that before. Can you give us a brief rundown of the kind of that chapter of your life? Because I don't think you've really talked about it too much. Oh, uh, well, I used to talk about it a lot because when I first started writing in 2008, I was in Austria, but uh, yeah, I've, it's funny. So I, I was thinking about this last night and I've never told this story before, so I will give it to you. I am (laughs) such a home. Well, I was when I was growing up, such a homebody because we moved around a lot. So I was born in Connecticut and then six months later, we moved to Chicago. And then six months later, we moved to Dallas. And then a few years later, we moved to Oklahoma And then we moved back to Dallas after a year. My dad was an investment banker during all the savings and loan scandals. So he was constantly, I guess, cheating people out of money and getting fired. And then we'd start over in a different place. And so I I grew up thinking my dad was like this maven of capitalism who was unassailable and stuff like that. And I always used to brag that he was in all of Michael Lewis's books, the guy who wrote Wolf of Wall Street. And then I realized like last year, like, oh, that means he's a real piece of shit. So, but he was great to me. So, but, so we moved constantly. And so then we went to Philadelphia and we, then we moved to Maryland. Then we moved back to Philadelphia and that's where I did high school. Then I went to Connecticut for college and I hated that because it was prep school kids at Trinity college. And it seems like every Trinity college is just filled with assholes. So I went to the university of Arizona. And while I was there, I, cause I had, had taken this Chinese history class in uh, college. I thought that I was going to major in art or history. And started loving Chinese history. And when I got to the University of Arizona, I was really deep into it because I had been big into the Mongols since I was a little kid. Like I started reading about the Huns and the Mongols and writing about them in seventh grade. And so when I got to when I got to University of Arizona, I had this opportunity to go to China for a summer and learn Chinese. And I went to Renmin University in Beijing and we had this little, there's a picture somewhere on the website. And I think I put it up on Instagram as well, like of our tiny little dungeon gym like when people think about dungeon gyms they don't know what they're talking about because dungeon gyms are filled with rust it's all cinder blocks there's maybe a squat rack it's rusty as shit this is what i'm talking about so there was one bench 
one squat rack, a pull-up bar, some kettlebells, and one barbell. And so this guy and I used to just go in there every day and train our asses off. And there was no AC and it was the middle of summer. So it's, you know, crazy humid in, in Beijing. And so we were training shirtless because you'd immediately so like soak your shirt. Like it was like you were in a downpour of rain. And so we just trained shirtless and people would line up outside the windows and watch us train, which was really fucking weird. But it was it was kind of fun. It was the only time I've ever trained with an audience. And so that was cool as shit. And I learned a good bit of Chinese, although I'm terrible at at like mimicking accents because. The tones, yeah, the tones kill yeah. me. Well, uh, it's especially bad for me because I grew up in an upper middle class family in the United States. So where they have like this like prejudice against developing a regional accent. And so it made me completely incapable of speaking foreign languages with an accent and being understood, especially in Chinese. So I struggled traveling around China, but I had a good time. Like we went to Inner Mongolia and I was the king of fucking Inner Mongolia for a weekend because the second we got off the train there and we were in, so we, back China back then was fucking crazy. There were people living in caves on the side of the train, on the side of the train tracks. So like yeah. there would be like four train tracks and on one side is all these fields and shit, I guess where the people worked. And on the other side is caves in this cliff face with all these cables running up it. So they had, they had lights and shit in these caves, but they were still troglodytes living in like open air caves. And it was wild. But, um, so we get to Mongolia. The second we get off the train, they, they just started wrestling us and it's this Mongolian jacket wrestling. And so they put a, like a vest on you, a leather vest, and you have to grab onto the leather vest. You can't let go and you can't touch the legs. There's no tripping. It's just upper body, all throws. And I had never done judo or freestyle wrestling. I'd only done scholastic wrestling. And I very, I came this close to throwing their best guy because I was just crazy strong. And he just rolled right through it and whipped me through the, he just launched me. It's the farthest I've ever been thrown. And he was this tiny little Mongolian guy. And when I got up, they just ripped my shirt off my back. Everybody started screaming. They were carrying me around like I won. And then they put me on a horse and I was like, I'd, I've never ridden a horse before. And it was like a giant Dalmatian. So I was like, I'm going to crush this horse. I was only 160 pounds or 150 pounds, but I felt big. And, and I rode the shit out of this horse. So now the Mongols are going fucking berserk about me. They would follow me into the bathroom and look at my dick while I was pissing. It was <laughs> bonkers. And I was straight edge at the time. So I like, but I knew that you couldn't decline to drink with a Mongol. Like it's the worst insult you could give. So they, they came over to me with this bowl of, I, it wasn't, I don't think it was kumis. I, it was some kind of liquor, but uh, just bowl after bowl after bowl, just poured it down my throat. And I arm wrestled everybody in their tribe and ended up losing to like this huge fat man they had as a ringer. And they tore my shirt off my back again. They like threw all the, to the food on the table onto the floor so we could arm wrestle. It was like a Conan movie. And then we had this huge dance party. There were no women there except for the girls that I was traveling with. But, but it was this huge dance party, all these guys, and they just like played techno out in the step and we had this huge dance party. It was fun as shit. So yeah, and then we traveled through through the rest of China. So we did Xi'an and Chung went to the tallest Buddhist monastery, saw the biggest Buddhist statue, stuff like that. And then I had dysentery through almost all of it because we always ate in Hepatitis Alley because the food's so fucking good in Hepatitis Alley. You have to eat there. And and I love jiaozi and baozi and like any kind of dumpling. I just love meat pies. Like I love Aussie meat pies. So so I, would, I just had dysentery. I was bleeding out of my ass the whole time. And when we went to Tibet, then I had al altitude sickness and uh, and I was bleeding out of the ass, but I still ran three miles up and down the mountain just because fuck you to my body. That's why. And that was wild because there were these monks doing this crazy like I it was a, like a slap drill of some kind. But they were just like one monk was standing in front of the other monk and slapping his hands in front of the guy's face as hard as he could. And I guess the other person was trying not to flinch. We never had it explained. Tibet was disgusting though. People were shitting in the streets. It was people would be in the middle of a crosswalk and drop trow shit in the streets, which was uh, like a step, a real step down from Beijing where they had the decency to shit on the sidewalk. It was, it, it was an experience. It like, it, it, you know, it was a developing nation and I had a huge hard on for China. So I was, 
willing to overlook a lot of the shit. And then when I saw them mistreating animals, I was like, mm, I, mm, this is not for me. All right. So getting to the travel part, when I got back, I, I finished out my, my studies in history. I only got two B's and they were from, I came to find out afterwards while I was writing about Indians for chaos and pain website, I realized that my professor who had given me two B's is the most eminent Indian history professor on planet earth. And he had told us, like, I've only given out one A in my life. And I was like, that's fucking horse shit. And I bitched to my dad about it, who told me that's how it happened back in the day. It was like an old school thing. So I was like, ah, whatever. I came to find out I was one of the only people who ever got B's from him. Like, this man just loves giving out shitty grades. But uh, so I like I, I'm studying all this cool Asian history and kicking ass at it. And I was like, oh, I'll go to grad school. But I had fallen in love with the first girl I had sex with because, again, and I was straight edge and I don't like playing sports so that I don't know how, what the rules are. So I was real late to the game and uh, she didn't want to move. So I, I, no, no, no. She, it was actually kind of weird. We kind of looked like brother and sister because we both had blonde hair, <laughs> blue eyes. We were almost the same size. She was the Wisconsin state champ in wrestling. And when we trained together, the world record was, we didn't know this because there was no way to look up world records and squats, but it was 350 for her weight class, 132. Every single time we squatted, she did 350 for a double with no belt on. Every single wow. time. And like she had cross strided traps. She once beat the shit out of a man who was driving a car. She pulled him out of the driver's seat and beat him down in the parking lot. Like this chick was bad. So when she was said, she I don't want to move. <laughs> <laughs> she, she might as well have been. And she, we were straight edge. So this was sober. We were sober maniacs. And so... Uh, she didn't want to move. So I went to the uh, University of Arizona grad program for a little while. And then they were like, no, 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 no. You won't ever get a job being a professor if you get a degree from here. So just either go somewhere else or do something else. And I was like, all right, I guess I'll go teach. So I taught seventh grade for a year and I was supposed to teach high school, like the highest level of history for high school AP. And, and then the first day they were like, oh yeah, our history teacher got fired and our PE teacher got fired and you like to work out. So you're both of those things now. And I was like, oh, this is the worst thing I've ever done. And it was awful. So after that, I bounced around jobs and stuff. And I was, I, at the time we were like promised that it didn't matter really what you did because you were like in college, cause you were going to get a job. You, you went through that as well. It's like, yeah. be a liberal arts guy. You will get a fucking job. You get a good job. And so I was, had faith in that process. And the first job I had getting out of school, I made a bunch of money. So I figured ah, fuck it. It's easy to get jobs, but the economy kept going to shit. Like the dot com boom happened the year that I graduated undergrad. So I had a job as a technical recruiter that went to shit. So I went to law school I hated lawyers and, and I found out lawyers don't make any fucking money. So I dropped out of that after a year. And so I'm bouncing around. And then I decided, my dad said, if you want to make a hundred thousand dollars or more a year, you need an MBA or a JD. And I had already tried the JD and fuck that shit. I, like I figured I could just argue my way through law school and that's you win because I can out argue anybody. Mm, no, that's not how it works. And so, yeah, so then I was like, oh, fuck it, I'll go to business school. And so I picked a business program that had a joint degree program so I could go study in Europe. And then I didn't care where the other half of it was, not thinking South Carolina was not for this guy. And uh, yeah, so that then I went to Austria, which is the greatest place on earth. And then South Carolina, which is the second worst place I've ever been. And I've been to a lot of places. So I can really see the uh, formation there between the chaos and pain style of your training then because the whole first chapter of your life just sounds like one big huge ball of chaos and pain. Oh, it, would, it, it kept going from there. Yeah, after grad school, <laughs> I lived in like three different places in South Carolina. Then I couldn't find a job because it was 2008 and the economy had blown up. So now I have a totally useless MBA and, and I had no idea what to do. I finally got a job in software in Birmingham, Alabama, which is the worst fucking place on earth <laughs> at least because i've never lived in mobile alabama but oh god it's the fucking worst and uh, so i slowly went insane there but that's where i set the world record in powerlifting because i was just a ball of hate and rage and drunkenness and uh, yeah and then i moved to pennsylvania i lived there for a couple of couple of years got even drunker and uh, became a even worse mess and then i moved to new jersey and now i'm okay uh, now life is good <laughs> <laughs> 
we kind of had similar trajectories because I lived in Asia as well, where I did Japan for three years, Thailand, Philippines, a couple of those. Oh, places. did you do the JET program? The uh... I did. Yeah, I became a school teacher as well for twenty years. So now I'm moving oh, on to right. chapters, of course. But yeah, yeah, it's funny how you know our experiences kind of reflect each other a little bit. Yeah. That's awesome, I, and it's fun because Australia is like just America with a slightly different accent. Honestly, I mean. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, we have the same mentalities. We have the same terrible white trash problem. It same obesity problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're a reflection of you guys. We just have stricter gun control. Luckily. You guys do it way better. You guys have health care and you don't get <laughs> shot when you go to the grocery. Oh, we're, we're losing that very quickly and we have a massive housing shortage. So the homeless here now is is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, it took me well, four, four months to find a house. So yeah, that's God, saying damn something. It. So we can't send our homeless to uh, Australia like Britain did? Yeah, we're already taking the rest of the world's animals at the moment. So. Fuck. I, not, that, not that I advocate anything like that. I don't mean to. But that was a joke, just a historical joke. Yeah. Good Lord. I, so how's, I, your I, train, is, how's your training going these days? Is it still chaos and pain style? Or as you get along in years, is it resembling something more along the lines of you know structure and pleasure? Just to you know throw a bad oh, joke out there. Oh yeah, no, I. It was a bad joke. It was a bad joke. It's <laughs> only six fifty one in the morning for me. It's still like dark outside, but that was that was the worst joke. It'll probably be told today. But uh, <laughs> no, no, and uh, <laughs> I forget the. So the guy who came up with the name Chaos and Pain was like my antithesis at Iron Sport Gym, where the guy who uh, came up with the "Do you even lift?" meme is from Iron Sport Gym, and I was the weekend manager there. And, and so this guy whose name was Kurt, I can't remember his last name, but he was a, he was a lightweight strongman champ for a long time, an amateur strongman champ. He was a sweet guy. And so he trained the opposite of me. Everything was out of a book. He never made a facial expression. He always knew what his attempts were going to be before he did them. And he would do the attempts and he would check the box in the book. And, and he was so uh, I forget. And one day he was like, what do you call your, your workout style? Like chaos and pain. And I was like, what do you call yours? Boredom and uselessness. And, and like, cause we were just constantly fucking with each other. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of boredom and tediousness. Cause I just a- hated the idea of the way he trained and his physique reflected it. It was not, it was nothing anybody wanted to look at. And so, but he's a lovely guy. I love the guy. He's a sweetheart and uh, nothing to disparage that man. But so yeah, no, my, my program is, uh, I don't even have a program. What I do is even more chaotic now than it was before, because uh, there's, I don't even know if I'm going to go to the gym on any given day anymore. It used to be like, I'm just going to go to the fucking gym and I'll figure it out once I get there because I had no life and I had nothing else to do. And I was compulsive about training. And so I just, six days a week, I went to the gym no matter what. And I figured out what I was going to do when I got there. Now I, we have a yoga swing that my wife put in, in the, in the living room. And I had been working on shoulder flexibility, mostly because I like had all this numbness and pain in my fingers that was waking me up constantly, my left hand. And, and I like, because I've torn this bicep and this tricep, I, and I broke this wrist in high school and played a full football game. Like I broke it in the opening kickoff, played a full fo- football game with a broken wrist. And then at dinner, my hand is just swollen and throbbing. And I was like, you think we got to go to the hospital about this? And my dad was like, yeah, I guess after dinner. So that's just kind of how I grew up. And like that actually, it, it led to the torn bicep, the torn tricep, because it pulled all of my muscles out of position. So I've been trying to like figure out how to alleviate that pain. And in doing so, I got rid of like headache pain. Like my face isn't puffy anymore. It was real like. I had that swollen, puffy American head, which is from playing football, actually. I can tell you it's because our faces and our necks are stuck together to our chest from playing football and smashing our heads into things. So basically your body just builds like a girder of knots around your neck as like a neck brace. And that's and then it like chokes your head. So that's why you get that like squishy fat face that all the power lifters have. Mm-hmm. I couldn't figure out what the fuck was wrong with my face or like why I didn't look pretty. And it's just because of all these knots. So now what I'm doing is half of it is stretches, like weighted stretches. I do a ton of weighted stretches, whether it be like, I love doing breathing squats, breathing front squats, where I just sit in the hole and I'll be down there 30 seconds sometimes with 135, just like kind of wiggling around and stretching. And then I'll stand up and drop right back down again. Like if you saw me in the gym, you would think I was mentally retarded. (laughs) 
I, it doesn't make any sense what I do, but I'll take a barbell and I'll just like hold it out at arm's length and then I'll twist it different ways. I'm sorry. I pulled the mic away from my face, but I'll, I'll twist it different ways. And like, I want to be strong in every single position because I realized that I was watching a Tai Chi movie and realized that I had just built brittle strength my entire life. All of my strength was brittle. Because like any steel that doesn't bend, if you watch like Forged in Fire or anything like that, steel that doesn't bend is shitty steel. And I couldn't bend. I couldn't twist. I just snap. And I was only strong in one position. You know what I mean? Standing up straight. And yeah. and I and I was embarrassed about that. So then I started dropping exercises because like, oh, well, I can't do that because my shoulder just genuinely does not move in that position. Or I can't lock this arm out anymore. And my abs were cramping up every time I do overhead presses, shit like that. So I was like, I'm a cripple now. I'm not even strong at all. And I can't, I mean, I was strong on certain things. Like I could still front squat 500 easily, but it was a half front squat. If I'm being honest, because it was a powerlifting squat. It, it looked like shit. And I realized I was just, it was like if I, if you gave a coloring book to a very mentally challenged three-year-old and told them to color the book. Uh, that's how I lifted my entire life. I was just like, ah, I'll do it as hard as I can, as fast as I can. And that's good. And it, like that nuts, that's not good in anything. Try that when you're going down on a girl, try as hard, as fast as you can. See how fast you get punched in the fucking face. Like it, you don't do anything like that, but that's how I lifted weights for the longest time. And, and I'm reading about all these old school guys and how they trained. And I had always read about the French making their lifts look good. And so that's what I'm trying to do now is like, I, do, I don't want to look like at any point I am struggling in the lift. I can either complete the lift with a smile on my face talking to you, or I can't lift it. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to get to that point, which looks way more chaotic than the shit that I used to do. It is less painful though. <laughs> Actually, no, I am way more sore every day now because I figured out how to how to breathing squat and I'll explain it to you as an exclusive if you like because nobody fucking knows how to do it but absolutely so when you do a breathing squat have you ever tried a breathing squat do you know what it is I, I do I'm not much of a, a squatter you know I hate to say but yeah being more aligned with bodybuilding but yeah that's fine that I mean breathing squats are a bodybuilding exercise you know breathing squats and pull yeah up. that's right McCallum back in his days Right. So when you think about doing a breathing squat, they say to expand your chest. And the way we always expand our chest is out wide, right? You go out. The thing with a breathing squat is, and the thing that we've all been missing, is you actually have to breathe your diaphragm up, up into your neck. So lifting your shoulders up. So you breathe, you pull your shoulders up, then you take a deep breath in, hold it there. It locks your diaphragm up. That's stretching your abs up. It's stretching your chest up. Every We all have these gross ass pecs from benching with an arch and never lifting our diaphragms up. So we all have that weird shit down here that we all think is gyno. It's not gyno and it's not fat. It's your fucking pecs folded over on each other and then locked to your lats so that you can maintain that stupid fucking arch rather than just benching like a human being with dignity and self-respect and just accepting the fact maybe you can't do 315. I see. Do you think the training back then in turn is as hectic as it was and chaotic as it was, did it still serve its purpose? Because, you know, you broke a world world records, you achieved a fantastic physique while doing so. So you can't argue against its effectiveness at the time. It's just that you've evolved, correct? Or Oh, yeah. No, no. I'm not, I'm not dragging what I did at all. And in fact, I was doing it right until I started trying to break the world record in powerlifting because I lost sight of what had made me strong in the first place, which was calisthenics. Because I, I, I have always been a huge calisthenics guy to the point where I never even mentioned it. And it's exactly like the old school lifters. Now that I'm looking at what they did, I'm realizing they didn't even mention it because it seems obvious that you would just do push-ups when you had free time or do pull-ups when you had free time or do some lying leg raises when you had time, because that's what you and I fucking grew up doing. When we were in high school, when I used to watch Rocky three and Rocky four every Friday and Saturday night, do push-ups and sit-ups through both of them, the whole fucking way, nonstop. It was just what I did on new year's day. I would do that many push-ups for the year. 
it just in a hundred push up or in a hundred, a uh, hundred rep clips, just bang, 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 bang. It would take me a half hour. And I tell people and they'd be like, how the fuck did you do that? And I'm like, how are you not doing this? It's literally the easiest thing on earth. But when I started doing powerlifting, I started cutting the calisthenics out thinking to myself, ah, well, I'm getting more work done with the weights. And I was doing it totally fucking wrong. When, if you look at my old programs, it was like weights and then go to the gym, do 30 minutes of arms and, and calisthenics. And then the next day weights. And then the next day arms and calisthenics. And then I started getting away from that, replacing the arms and calisthenics with more weights, more heavy weights, more heavy weights. And I realized just like the old time guys did that if you do five days of really heavy weights, you're going to cut out all the shit that made you strong in the first place. And then you develop all these weird weaknesses because you're focusing too hard on stupid competition exercises. It's interesting that you say that about calisthenics because over the last three or four months, that's all I've been forced to do because I've been doing a road trip around Australia. So there's no gyms out in the middle of the desert and the outback. So it's just been push-ups, chin-ups with rings where I could find something to tie them to. Oh, you know, I love numbers. rings. They make you so sore, right? Woo. Yeah, 100%. But the effect, I've been amazed at how much I've been able to retain my mass. And, you know, you've been killing it on the content front recently with the social media. You've been Thank you. putting out a killer podcast. You're pumping out great eBooks one after the other. You even appeared recently on an ESPN retrospective about the history of the American Gladiators TV show. Yes. And I wanted to ask, like, how did that come about? And is this something you want to do more of in the future? That is, so the second I got done with that interview, I was like, this is what I was born to do. Like, I, so I've been really, I took the job um, bouncing that weed spot that I bounced for, for two years. I took that job because I had gotten so weird after COVID that I was like, I need to get out and start talking to people to get my banter down. Because when I did the ESPN thing, it took me like a half hour to kind of get into the flow of talking, but I had prepped, I had reams of notes. So I talked for three hours. I gave them the history of every lifting thing. He was just asking me random questions because he was like, this man's prepped for everything. We're using you for research now. So hopefully I get to do more of that. I would love to be, at, and I've never, ever, ever wanted to be the star of my, my site or the website or anything. I've never wanted to be in the spotlight, but I'm really good at teaching people, I feel like, and I'm so passionate about it and people are so fucking bad at it. I feel like I need to get out there and do it right. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, no, it was a fantastic job you did. So credit to you on that one. And uh, speaking of, I, yeah. When, so, I do, when I can put some money together, I'm going to buy the footage and release it to you guys so that you can see all three hours of me just, it, just dumping the most information you've ever seen. It was seriously a PhD dissertation de defense. It was fucking masterful. I've never prepped for anything like that. Yeah, you should develop some kind of like lecture series or something that you sell online that has basically a history of, you know, similar to like Randy Roach's equivalent, but a verbal spoken topic on the history of physical culture or something that I would pay money for that as well, especially if it was presented by you, you know, somebody who's passionate. I would love to do that. It's uh, at this point, it's really like I have to put out the the daily posts just to make mm -hmm. enough money so I don't starve to death in the dark. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you've been diving into the topic of history now for years and you're recognized as the people's historian for all things physical culture in, at this moment. So do people that fail to study the history of, say, training and nutrition, are they missing like a large part of the puzzle or doing their own training and nutrition a disservice by not delving into the people and the events of the past? I'm of two minds. So for the bodybuilders who are training the way that bodybuilders always have where it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to follow the biggest guy in the gym and kind of see what he's doing and do what, what that is. And they stay off the fucking internet and don't listen to l anyone. They'll be fine. But if they're listening to anybody on the internet, who's trying to give them anything that has the word science is even closely resembling anything that they say, stay the fuck away from it. Or you need to go back. And, you need to go back and research lifting from the beginning because people even misuse the word program. I mean, they misuse it. It's offensive to me as a person who like you stood Lord, my intellect over other people and my command of the English language and just be like, you did that word wrong. You did that word wrong. Let me explain the etymology of the word program. So the word program has 
for the last couple hundred years only related to theatrical programs or things of that nature, where it is a presentation of some kind and it gives you a list of the events and then that's it. That's what a program is. The word program as it relates to computers has only come into the common parlance since the 1990s. So the word program as a verb has only existed for 30 years. I mean, it's, it, it, it did previously exist, but it was not used in the same way. There was, There is no way to program for success. It is the most anti-scientific thing that sports scientists have yet to produce. And I'm, I use that term very loosely. I find it offensive because, again, it's an oxymoron. These people are peddling bunk science at best and pseudoscience as, as a general rule. And people are following it into shit like anti-vax because they're, they're following these idiots who don't know what the fuck they're talking about using small sample sizes and people who have been discredited in their field and they take that as valid because they don't know the difference between a good source and a bad source. And I think that it's really been muddled by sports scientists. And the field of sports scientists, field of sports science was just invented by a dude in Russia in the early 1900s so he wouldn't get liquidated during various revolutions and shit. Like he needed a job and he needed to be an intellectual was basically untouchable. It, it was, the whole thing is just, it's all hokum. It's all bunk. It's all lies. And then people have turned it into this quote unquote science and it's truly offensive. So that is the historical thing. And also like we've lost calisthenics out of training, which so training back in the early 1900s and the late 1800s was it was a, a base level of calisthenics and like light dumbbells and stuff like that. Then on top of that, you have kettlebells. And uh, usually the, they used a 72 pound kettlebell. That was like the thing that they used. And the way they built all their biceps was this uh, kettlebell curl, which is, do you know what a kettlebell curl is? Do you use kettlebells at all? Not so much. No, but it's, yeah, it was the thing that Sandow used to do from like holding it out to the side and filling it up or no. Well, so that was another thing that they did. They, they'd hold arms out at, at extension. And so you yep. look at all these, like the guy I'm going to talk about in a little while, because you asked me to like who I wanted to talk about. His name was Charles Poip, and I don't speak French, but it's uh, P-O-I-R-E. So I think I pronounced it cor correctly. And so they were real big on arm extensions where they hold the, hold the weight out at arm's length. And so they would hold it out at arm's length for time, or they would just muscle a weight out and hold it there. They would also muscle a weight out overhead and hold it there for long periods of time and then lower it to the side and hold it for a long period of time. Stuff like that builds a different kind of strength, and it also puts your muscles in the positions they're supposed to be in in order to be properly defined. And so when you look at like a powerlifter's physique and he just looks like kind of chubby and fat and squishy and doesn't really have the definition that he should have, it's basically because he hasn't flexed his muscles into their proper position. And so stuff like those arm extensions that we've totally lost really helps with that. Isometrics, moving a weight slowly through space rather than quickly because Olympic weightlifting has completely changed everybody's perceptions of how weight there's, is supposed to be moved. And we lost the conception of lifting as art rather than science because the Victorian age, like people who were trying to sell programs and things, use the word of science as a way to kind of hook people in because it was a very popular thing to do at the time. Science was basically just in its nascent stages in the 1800s. And so it was up and the science news was just coming out. So it was a, like the big buzzword. So if you put science into it, everybody's like, oh, it has to be good. I guess much like now. Yeah, it still is like the evidence based community. Now they oscillate from one spec end of the spectrum to the other as a basis to sell their programs. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's a same kind of self-sustaining perpetual bullshit machine. That's exactly what it is. I mean, the word charlatan comes from the fitness industry, the supplement industry in, in particular. So, I, I mean, those are the people who sold snake oils and elixirs and Vin Mariani, the athlete's wine that was filled with cocaine that everybody used back in the day. So, And that's another thing. You wonder how these guys did all these crazy ass feats because they didn't have steroids cocaine and methamphetamines you want to know how the people were fucking ripped in the 50s everybody was on speed everybody was on speed that's why they were all making such fucking terrible decisions and we were constantly in these stupid ass wars nobody gives a fuck about korea i mean good for the koreans but we don't want to fight a war there 
It's so goddamn cold that the fucking bark freezes off the trees. Nobody's fighting over that shit. But, ah, let's take a bunch of speed and fight everybody. I heard the Australian soldiers, because we have a very famous day that commemorates Australia's first kind of baptism of fire in World War One, where the Australians charged Gallipoli. the beach of Gallipoli. Correct, yeah. So that was like our kind of yeah. nation of war. And all of those soldiers were choked off their heads, apparently, according to like one of the history of war books. And that was the most requested item from the home front was cocaine for the Aussie soldiers. I mean, what else is going to get you to jump up out of a hole that you're in and run directly at a bunch of guns? Cocaine's the only thing that's going to make you think that you can do it. I mean, that's literally it. <laughs> Cocaine or meth. Otherwise, you're like, mm, no, no, I don't like the odds on this. Thank you. <laughs> so one of your recent books, that Bite Size History, is an awesome compendium of different people and histories from across a whole range of eras that I kind of wanted to know, like, who deserves to be more recognized by the average lifter in this day and age? And it was a Charles Poor or... Yes. Charles Poir, or Poir. So he was born in 1866, and uh, he died in 1935. And you, so now we got these bodybuilders who, they basically live till 40. And uh, when they die, everybody's like, ah, fucking good, good. I'm glad he's dead. But actually, bodybuilders back in the day lived a long time, and people liked them. And uh, Charles Poir had the prettiest arm on planet Earth. He Except for Bobby Pandora. No, actually, Charles Poir was so much bigger than Bobby Pandor, and he was still lean. The man was pretty. He was lean. He had a... So these guys all took their measurements cold, by the way, which is something that bodybuilders would never do now because you're always measuring up against these bullshit measurements anyway. But, uh, dude, his bicep measured 17 inches cold. Wow. 14-inch forearm measured straight, not gooseneck because they didn't gooseneck their forearms. What do you think your forearm gooseneck is right now? Not 14, know. probably. You're not. <laughs> yeah, it's probably 13 and a half. I mean, most people's yeah. forearms are 13 and a half somewhere out of there. So he had huge forearms, huge biceps, and he was considered to have the prettiest arms on planet Earth. And so he owned this gym called Roubaix Gym. And this is where the greatest lifter or the greatest lifter on Earth and the greatest wrestler on earth both trained paul pons and apollon and so you have these three guys who are all like they're about six foot six two well the other two guys were six foot six two this guy was five nine two hundred pounds with 17 inch cold measured arms so with a pump he's what 18 and a half inches at five nine two hundred natty as fuck right abs the whole nine yards he his waist was 35 but they didn't measure their waist contracted or anything like that it was and they also didn't use vanity sizing on their jeans. So if you're wearing size 34 jeans nowadays, guys, you have like a 38-inch waist, by the way. It's it's not good stuff. But anyway, so yeah, and this guy just like, he was able to muscle out crazy weights. He had a, an amazing clean and jerk. But the thing was, it for these French lifters, it was not about how much weight they could move. They were always trying to do how much weight you could do. But this guy did it with a smile on his face. He was like a really good looking guy, suave as fuck. So he'd be sweet talking these women. And then like, so some guy would come in and do a clean and jerk with some weight. And instead of him doing it, a fast clean and jerk, he would move slow and controlled through the movement, not touching the weight to his body, get it to his chest, smiling at the ladies, and then press it overhead, maybe sing a little song, put it back down to his chest, put it back down on the ground and make you look like the biggest fucking dickhead who ever lived. Like, way to be a try-hard asshole. Like, that's what this guy was always doing. And I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never heard of this guy. And it's amazing how many French notable people in physical culture there were back then. Because I remember, like, there was a guy around the 1920s, I think, Charles Rigolou, or he had, like, some kind of yep. barbell pressing thing that I don't think has ever been broken still. I'm not sure about that. But I remember, like, a few years ago, a Russian guy tried to beat that recording so he, he pressed Apollon's wheels and so the guy oh, I mentioned yeah. before Apollon so this guy was so big that I thought he was a goof back I thought he was just bullshit that he didn't even exist uh, the guy had 19 inch arms and and 17 inch forearms 17 inch forearms like he they couldn't so this guy Charles Poir would always change his weights out and tell him that they were lighter than they were and he never was unable to lift something 
So they could never figure out how strong he was and he would never test himself because he didn't care. But, and he was also like damn near mentally retarded. So, so he traveled around with, he was the strongest man in the world and Paul Pons was his friend and he was the greatest wrestler on earth. The two of them trained together as like a duo and, and so the one guy was so dumb that the other guy drowned behind their boat. They were fishing together and he got caught in a fishing net and drowned in a foot and a half of water. Just being dragged behind the boat because Apollon is just being dumb and staring in the other direction or whatever. So you mentioned you mentioned that the nutrition was so shit back then. But were these guys in particular you know, like sons of bushes or something or did they have special access to the meat? That uh, so that. Get? That's another thing about the history that is really important that everybody misses is at, people talk about genetics now. They don't know what the fuck they're saying. That word should not be in a bodybuilder's mouth ever. The word genetics. They don't know what they're saying. But but back in the day, the French especially, and it, it's in a book called The Kings of Strength, which I really recommend. And it's all about these old time French lifters. Yeah, I have that book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so fun. So this guy's in it. But yeah, so they were mostly killed in World War One. Like, and if World War One didn't kill them, their gym was destroyed. And then if they survived, World War Two killed them or their gym was destroyed. You know what I mean? There were two. Vienna had the most gyms on Earth at the time. There were 200 gyms in and around Vienna. And that was like 100 gyms more than there were, were in the rest of Europe combined. <clears throat> Italy, Germany, everywhere. Like they just, there weren't that many gyms. But France had a couple of really, really good gyms in Paris because there was the Parisian cafe culture at the time. So you would you would drink, you would lift, you would eat. These guys ate and ate and ate. And that was, so going back to your diet thing, the food wasn't good and everybody had low key food poisoning at all times because there was no like refrigeration or anything like that. But they did have cocaine, like I mentioned, and, and they took a lot of coke. Like Vin Mariani, for instance, a liter of it uh, was Bordeaux wine with coca leaves that amounted to about 372 milligrams of, of cocaine, as I recall, in a liter. So, which is, I mean, that's a third of a gram of coke, which isn't a lot of coke, but they were drinking it while they trained. And, and then they would, oh wait, yeah, they, they would do, they would drink it while they trained. And then they would, they would do coke before they trained. They would do coke after they trained and they were chugging this shit all day long. So, I mean, they even did like, like competitions with breaking the tops off wine bottles and shit like that. And, there was a wrestler named Charles Glass, or no, Charles Whistler, who died eating champagne flutes. He was he was he died in Australia eating champagne flutes. He was the most vicious wrestler of his day, and he went uh, he beat I think he beat William William Muldoon. He was an Australian, right? Yeah, I believe he beat William Muldoon exactly. and was celebrating. He got drunk. I'm sure he was drinking a lot of in Mariani, but he started eating champagne flutes to show everybody how tough he was. Cocaine's a hell of a drug, and died. But yeah. So there was a lot of coke, but they, so they were in this cafe culture where like there was a lot of leisure time for these guys because they were performers and they would perform mostly at night a couple of times in the, in the theaters. And then the, the, during the day they would just like train and get drunk and like scam on women. Like they had a really good time. It was a, it was a good time. Yeah. With, with the thing about the stimulants, like, I, I don't know, this is just a, a slight tangent, but obviously back, you know, McCallick was a big amphetamine, amphetamine addict. Mike Menser obviously battled yep. his demons with amphetamines, but during the golden Amen. era, Ray Menser died at like 40. Correct. Yeah. Within a couple of days of each other, but were amphetamines quite popular during the golden era, but just not talked about. Is that how they sustain these marathon long training sessions? Were they all doing amphetamines at the time? Cause they were oh, all yeah. easily obtainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were really easily obtained at the time. And all the vets took it back from World War II. So, like, they were just be giving out buckets of meth at, at during the war in World War II. And so when all the guys came back from World War II, like Steve Reeves and all those guys who had served, they brought all that shit to Muscle Beach. So they're all doing meth and, like, uh, and which is how you end up with, like, the, the a bunch of dudes living together in a house that muscle house by the sea that steve reeves and everybody lived in a bunch of sweaty dudes living together like there was a lot of very dude oriented stuff that people failed to fail to acknowledge and they also failed to acknowledge that meth leads to i mean even the most heterosexual man on earth will look at his buddy and be like what does your dick taste like sir it went on meth so it's just sometimes shit happens shit happens when you party
I remember uh, John D. Fair's book. You know the you know the uh, Iron Culture historian John D. Fair. He talks about uh, the Bob you know, they were all, uh, Hoffman. Hoffman, yeah, yeah, yeah. And him and his crew. You know, again, they were deep into the drugs. They were all into wife swapping and orgies and that. It's just like a very kind of hidden element of uh, you know, it was two, you know, whatever they. It was two of those guys, two of the York barbell guys, who got Muscle Beach shut down. Right. Yeah, they raped the they black belt. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I think it was statutory. I don't know what it was. Because yeah. from from what the stories were, these guys were not like, they weren't out raping people. It was they just everybody was doing a boatload of drugs and they were trying to shut down Muscle Beach. So they were like, look at all that and then saying any. Like the, even these white men are having sex with black women. Like, it, yeah, because it was the 50s or 40s or whatever it was. Yeah. It was a, you know, so you think California is like this wonderful place. But it, they had segregated beaches at the time. So, like, you couldn't even find a black person to rape. I wonder how that story even came to be. Speaking of degenerates, one of your recent books called West Side Connection, it delves into your distaste for Louis Simmons and the contemporary West Side crew. And, you know, that chapter of history was pounded into our collective brains like religion for so long. But you say the whole praise for Louis Simmons and his crew was undeserved and misguided. Can you go into a little bit more detail of why you feel this way about Louis? Because I've never heard any of this before. Sure. First, I will not take the advice of a fat man with a machete in the gym. Fuck that fat shit. I'll piss on his corpse. And who's that other fat dickhead who carries a fucking... The guy who tells people how to squat wrong. Rip a toe. Rip a toe. Rip a toe. He carries a fucking machete around the gym, too. What the fuck are you doing carrying a machete in the gym? That's even dumber than UFC head, middleweight champ Sean Strickland carrying a gun to go get a drunk guy off his fucking driveway. What a deceit. These are, these are guys that missed out on the Vietnam experience. So, Jeez, the guy overcompensating. died in Vietnam. So, Louie is a fat, dumb piece of shit, obviously, with a machete in the gym. And what he did was take a very, very good training system which was the original West Side Barbell system, which was basically a synthesis of what the guys at York Barbell did. And then they had the best lifters in the fucking world just all lived in L.A. and they all shared their training systems. So they got box squats from Alan, Alan Steven, the uh, Mr. America, and they were picking up different stuff from different people and the pullover and press and doing all this different stuff. And Pat Casey started training with them and he was breaking the world record in, in, in the bench press. They had Olympic thrower. They had three Olympic gold medalists in throwing who were coming up with all these crazy Olympic lifts. And and I just realized that, like, Brian Oldfield, who was another American thrower who I've talked about recently, he was actually a product of this system because he was trained by a guy who trained in the West Side program. I think it was Hal Connolly. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, I mean, like, you can see the direct line of all these amazing lifters that come out of this system. And the Soviets who were supposed to be using the conjugate system at the time, which was developed for people who lived in the Soviet system where bodybuilding was illegal and there were no gyms outside of state run gyms, which were in major cities where these lifters didn't live. So if they weren't at the training center for the six months of the year, they were at home where there was no food. They were not they were legally disbarred from lifting weights. Unless they lifted in an underground gym at the in a basement of a high rise that was like you'd go to prison for lifting in. So they couldn't train, they couldn't eat, and they were living this miserable existence where they were filled with pollutants and just waiting to die. And then they would go back in and have to be trained back up and fed back up and filled with all these drugs so that they could actually go and do the shit they were supposed to do. That's what periodization is. And Louis Simmons is fucking stupid. So he doesn't understand anything about history or about science, or about the way human bodies work, because he is a fat white man stuck in the shittiest place in America, surrounded himself with a bunch of felons who were also fat and filled with meth, and then combined the worst system that the world had. That So George Friend was part of West Side Barbell. He created all their programming. The Soviet lifters would go to George Friend and say, this conjugate shit sucks. Can you give me what you guys do? He wrote their programs and sent them back so they would beat the Americans on York Barbell, who would train with Westside in the summer, by the way. 
And and so he's training the people who are beating the guys he's training with, which is fun. And but they're supported by the Soviet like machine, so they have money behind them and all that shit. Whereas our guys had no money, they were paying their own bills, they were working through their training. And and so Louis doesn't understand any of this. Thinks the Soviets beat us with a superior system, combines their inferior system with the superior system, and then sells it using a bunch of fat dudes filled with meth who are taking a break from committing hate crimes so that they can do this stupid three-inch lift badly, wearing bulletproof panties, bulletproof knee wraps, and a suit that would prevent them from getting any kind of a bomb blast, back blast from a nuclear assault or something like that. The whole thing's fucking stupid. If your suit can squat 200 pounds without you, you're not squatting shit, pussy. And if you gotta wear a fucking girdle, you're a fat piece of shit. Also, fuck everybody who's got a CPAP machine. That's not cool. You're a fat, sickly piece of shit, and you're not strong. You're just a weak piece of shit. Fuck Juju Mufu. I hope his fucking plane crashes when he flies to his neck. <laughs> fuck that dude. <laughs> I'm seeing shades of the old Jamie Lewis again now. I love it. Oh, it's it, it's never been anything different. It's just that I'm trying to be more relaxed, <laughs> Alice. But you get me talking about these dickheads, and I fly off the head. I'm really trying to be like a nicer person, but we're lots of bright colors now. But we'll, right. we'll shift gears a little bit. Like as I was saying, I was traveling. I've been How many traveling. Have I wished death on yet? To, it's just, it's a lot. But you we're going for the right one. Like, really hope he jokes out his next fucking tomahawk steak. That lying sack of pussy shit. <laughs> I try to get the YouTube census to cancel my channel. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry. You can bleep all that out. No, 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 not at all. No, People it's all saying bleeps. They they message me. They're like, oh, no, no, no. I I just leave it in. I swear all the time. I don't care. But you know, this is not a money making thing for me. Oh, but, well, then I'll, <laughs> try not, I'll try not to wish death upon anybody else, so we don't get. No, no, no. Keep it going. I, I love it. Yeah. Oh, well, it, no, it's not. You can't. You can wish death. You just can't promote violence. I'm not promoting any violence. I, I'm hoping no, plane no, crashes and choking incidents. Correct. Yeah, that's it. Or maybe just that their non-functioning brains just decide to give up the ghost and just, yes. they just yeah. immediately get connected to God's Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> so I was talking about my uh, recent road trip around Australia, and I've been using your Feast, Famine, and Ferocity program for that entire time. Like I said, there's no gyms out in the outback or the desert. I was just been doing the bodyweight training for two or three times a week, and I can seriously say like at 49, I've just maintained the most, and I'll, I'll put the pictures up so people can see, just such a ripped and muscular physique just naturally. It's it's amazing how well this approach works, yet it's so counterintuitive because we're so conditioned to sort of do 12-week bulking phases along with the 12-week cut. And if you're not doing those length of phases, you're not going to get anywhere. But this, can you just give us the history and the rationale behind this approach? Because most people would think it's bananas, but it works so well. Sure. And this is another instance where studying your history really helps you understand it. So it'll become, a, I think what, what happened was marketing fucked up our intuition. Because when you really think about it, the, the Feast of Famine diet, it, which is, it's a period of basically fasting, followed by a period of eating whatever the fuck you want. Because that is the way people have always eaten. So like, especially in Europe, if you look back in the day, if you weren't rich, the way you got your protein was on feast days. So they, they would be days. There were like 200. There, there ended up being like 200 of them a year for Catholics. And the reason was because the poor people were so poor, they lived on beans and rice and wheat and gruel, like literally eating gruel. They were eating oatmeal or cornmeal or something like that and subsisting on that in between these feast days where they would just eat and drink and fill themselves and stuff themselves and they'd get 6,000 calories in a day and 10,000 calories in a day. And then they go back to eating gruel for a while. And they're, but their, their training didn't, they, like their way that they lived didn't change. They were still going through all of the same shit. And so I'm reading this and I'm like, all right, so this couldn't be that we have to have. And it didn't make any sense anyway. If you think about it, how the fuck were you getting 30 grams of protein every three hours a hundred years ago? You couldn't do it. There were, I mean, refrigerators didn't exist. And people will say, oh, well, you can drink raw milk and fucking die and die. Or, yeah, what are you doing? Sucking on the nipple of a cow every fucking three hours? It doesn't make any sense. It could not have happened. And so then I'm reading scientists say, 
well, there's no way to absorb 90 grams of protein in one sitting. What? Tell that to the fucking caveman who just killed a mastodon. Like, who hasn't eaten in three days because he's been hunting this herd. And so now the three pounds of meat that's sitting in his stomach is going to stay there under, undigested, according to the, the old school vegetarians and and the fucking sports scientists, because he, you just can't digest 90 grams of protein in one sitting. That's crazy. What? So how did we get here? How did we get here? So I'm doing that research, and there was a guy who wrote a book called The Warrior Diet back in the day. Do you remember that book? Ari, Ari Hoffmaker, or whatever his name was here. Exactly. And his diet, in his diet, you can see a little bit the makings of the feast. And now you're shaking your head. You're going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it was like you'd kind of not eat too much during the day. It was real light. You'd eat, you'd eat a little bit here and a little bit there. And then it was about the structure of your meals after that. Though you were eating re leafy green vegetables like that first and stuff like that. And that is historically inaccurate because, I, you know, I'm doing all this research trying to figure out what, what the guys were actually eating in the in the 1800s and so it was seasonal at like because you didn't have supermarkets supermarkets didn't exist until the 1940s and even then you didn't have non-seasonal foods until the last like 40 years or something like that so you're dealing with foods that you can get in season and foods that you're basically growing yourself so you're not getting a lot of variety they're eating a lot of wheat or they're eating a lot of corn and it's still going against everything that we've ever been told well, there's no way you can build pro you can build muscle on that because corn isn't a complete protein, right? Until I talk to my scientist co-host who taught science classes for 30 years, and she goes, "Oh, actually, there is a fungus that grows on corn that uh, grows naturally, and when you eat corn on the cob or you know non non mass produced corn, you are getting a complete protein because the fungus that grows on the corn actually completes the protein for you. It has lysine in it or whatever you need in order to complete the protein." So you can subsist on corn if you just, because it is a superfood. And so, all right. So you can subsist on corn, which I've been told is impossible. And I, you know, I did all these paleo diets, uh, like uh, reading about all that shit. And, and I know that paleo dieting works, but by the same token, I don't know what doesn't work. You know what I mean? Cause I've always dieted so assidu assiduously. For, for 10 straight years, I did the Apex Predator diet. Like, that's no cap. Straight. I keto dieted like a psychopath for 10 years because I lived in a place I hated. I hated everybody around me. I never ate out with anybody, and I just... It, it didn't matter. I was feeding the machine. <laughs> While that worked, I didn't learn anything from it. You know what I mean? Because I was overeating, overeating, overeating all the time. So then I started getting into, like... Because, you know, the show Vikings was on. Vikings would go on, they would go on campaign in the summer and they would not eat a lot because they were on campaign. So they were rowing constantly. Then they would go and fight a battle, feast like crazy, and then get back in their boats and go do it again. And you have that guy, Orm Storolfsson, who carried a ship's mast six steps or whatever and then collapsed underneath. Yeah. And then it took, it took half Thor like two years of straight training, filling himself with every drug he could find, weighing 400 pounds to beat that record with every spotter on earth. Like he it had to be the most perfect conditions on earth. And I'm like, how the fuck was that guy that strong? Very, it, very, as, yeah. Right. So they're not eating all summer, but, and they're rowing like crazy doing all this cardio. And then I realized people's activity levels have always been cyclical. If you look at, just like if we're, you know, if you just if you look at the way your human activity like occurs during the day and the way your hormone cycles fluctuate, and then you start looking at how seasonal seasons affect that and seasonal affective disorder is a literal thing and it changes your behavior. It changes your diet. It So we're we've been ignoring all this stuff and instead we're just focused on the clock, always on the clock. And so the feast, famine, or ferocity diet was a way to drag people off the clock and into that more intuitive method of dieting where you're actually listening to your body and you're actually able to see what works and what doesn't work. So if you want to extend your fasting period because you think to yourself, ah, oh, well, I'm too fat. This can't possibly work. I'm going to fast longer than he says. You will find out quickly 
yeah, that last week is going to fucking put you near the ground. You are going to be dragging yourself around because that's not how it's done. Like you got to kind of go at the pace of life. And so that's where I was trying to do it. Like get people off of the pace of the clock and get on to the pace of life, which is how I came up with the Feast, Famine, or Ferocity diet. And, it, it, and you, do, it was, you do adapt to the phases. The more you do the, the, uh, the famines, the second, the third, the fourth, they get easier as you go. Mm-hmm. And you find that you're, you start to kind of galvanize your thinking and your efforts a lot more on those, on those famine days because your body kind of goes into you know, a heightened state where training becomes a lot more focused, even though you may be doing less of it. Uh, you think it becomes better because you're not slowed down by food all the time. And yep. one other thing that I really noticed on it, because I've been a long-term carnivore, and I always found that when I get off the carnivore diet and maybe have some carbs, the carbs make me feel shit. However, on the feast and famine diet, when I would restrict my calories to starvation levels and then include carbs in the feast, the backlash of the carbs never happened. So like I would feel better with having the carbs after a phase of famine, which was revolutionary, like a massive aha moment to me. Because then also my muscles would get more full. I would feel fantastic. And I was like, oh, wow, I can eat normally again for at least two weeks. Yeah, because it, it changes your insulin sensitivity. The science of it is actually in the book. But yeah, it's, and so all of those, and it's also American, the Native Americans, the problem with obesity and diabetes also played into this diet. I didn't have a way to put everything into the book. But so they're in the American Southwest. And also don't Amer- uh, Australian Aboriginals have a problem with diabetes as well? Correct. Yeah. And they're very seasonal eaters traditionally as well off the land. Exactly. And when they, when it came to just eat all the time, eat the same thing all the time, their, their bodies just rebelled because that is not how fucking life works. And yeah. yeah, And I mean, Tanzania, it's not Tanzania. It's the other one, Tasmania. I cannot, I confuse those two constantly, (laughs) but Tasmania was under a very heavy agricultural development for like tens of thousands of years and then it was all destroyed in the 1800s but like that was a very complex like agricultural system they had there and their 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 bodies were adjusted to that and and taking and taking it away from them really clearly like hurts your body so i'm not suggesting that people starve themselves because i think that there's a lot of disordered eating in in lifting to begin with but by the same token, it's so disordered to think we have to eat, 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 eat. That's how you end up with a CPAP machine. And being hungry, like you said, focuses you. It it does, it makes you better. And the I know this seems ridiculous, but it's one of the things I've kind of been trying to restrict my eating a little bit. Not so much because I want to lose weight, but I'm trying to find out how much protein do we actually need? How much do I actually need to eat? Because when you go back and you see Arnold say, and it, I repeat this to myself, you go back and you see Arnold say, oh, well, I'm competing. I just try to get a gram of protein a day. That's it? I'm like, really? That's it? That couldn't be right. But then I went to jail, kept the, kept all my size in jail. I mean, I got a little fatter, but I still stayed big in jail, like eating whatever the fuck I could. And so that, then I'm starting to see, all right, it's not actually as deep as we thought it was. It's not as critical as I thought it was that we had to always be eating and we had to always be eating the right things. And that all just kind of coalesced it all with the history into the Feast, Famine, and Frosty diet, which had originally been part of a larger book that I had planned called Go Viking. But with all the 2020 shit, I just was like, I think... Anything having to do with Vikings, I'm just going to avoid. Yeah, because I remember back in Muscle Media's Taborn Al- Arkefeld, he started that kind of periodized kind of eating with cycling the high calorie phases with low calorie phases. But he, I think he approached it wrong and it didn't pan out. So therefore, he got kind of discarded on the dustbin of history. But you re- you blew the dust off and yep. yeah, worked, yeah, the, made it workable. And I think it was, right? The ABCD, yeah, correct. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it's not that he wasn't wrong. He was on the right path. It was just said like, right. uh, yeah. you know what? I'm sure his his methods did work for a lot of people, but it was just like uh, you kind of you see something and you you iterate on it and make it a little bit better. But whereas a lot of the guys in the past, like it took uh, Louie a little while to acknowledge like, oh, yeah, I didn't come up with this West Side Barbell shit. I just want people to know right out of the gate. Like, I'm not saying I did this myself. I'm saying that I 
uh, combined a bunch of shit, just like Bruce Lee did, just like every intelligent person before him. You, you research everything as thoroughly as you can, and then you coalesce into, you know, your own version. Exactly, because I think, you know, one of the best entry points into your history stuff, especially, uh, you know, is your article series, There's Nothing New Under the Sun. That's just a great dive-in point for anybody wanting to learn about the history because they think that a lot of this stuff is just recently new and innovative and someone's come up with the idea of kettlebells in the last 20 years. No, this shit has been like two 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 and a half thousand years old, like you mentioned. And, uh, Four and a half thousand years. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, correct. BC is the oldest. The ancient, yeah. the ancient back or something were lifting kettlebells back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> you, you look at those old statues of Hercules and he's jacked. And his calves are enormous. And man, you, you've shed light on the facts because we always sort of thought that those statues of the ancient Greeks were idealized conceptions, almost like comic book representations. No, but they used the thing called the the lost wax method, and they cast those a lot of those statues on actual fucking people. Yep. So there were people that were walking around like that. They weren't just making this shit up out of like comic books or anything, you know, back in the day. To just that made... end, there's a statue in in paris and it's hercules battling the hydra and it is it was made from a cast of of paris's like most famous strongman of the day i forget his name off the top of my head but but he's fucking jacked and like that's another one where you're like it's the 1700 like america is just becoming a country and this man has 18 and a half inch ripped biceps what there's this mass, massive German statue of Prometheus, and one of the uh, people on my Instagram messaged me and said, "Oh, do you know that was based on Happenschmidt back in the day?" And oh, this, this fucking statue's jacked. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it to you later on, or I'll put it up on the podcast so people can see because it's an it's an awesome statue. Yeah, that is, I. Nice. Yeah, it, uh, it was always leg day throughout <laughs> history until the modern day, and I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news for that. But I actually, I was just, so my wife and I, we genuinely do nothing but watch documentaries in our free time. And if I want to watch a movie, I have to watch it before my wife gets home from work. And so we were watching about, it was a, it wasn't, it didn't even have anything to do with lifting at all, but they were talking about a number of different prominent authors in Britain in the, I think it was the 16th century because it was when cafe culture happened in Britain. And King Henry VIII was picking up women with the size of his calves. And it's one of, if you look at pictures of Henry VIII, even when he's a big fat fuck, like it's still like he's got defined ass calves. And uh, dudes used to pick up women with their calves back in the day. And you can see like they always talk about the delicate curve of his calf or whatever. And I, I, back in the, when I was a kid, I'm like, who cares about calves? I've always had big fucking calves from sprinting everywhere. But I guess I would have done well back in the day, huh? Yeah, because I suppose back then they had those laws where you couldn't show any part of your body. So the calves were the only thing that was on display at the end of the day. Well, you the know, guys the could show whatever the fuck they wanted. But the, uh, yeah. Yeah, the women the women couldn't show shit. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of blasts of the past, um, you've been really scathing towards Mensa. And he's making a massive resurgence back at the moment. I'm on social is that media. fucking happening? I don't know. Like every bad penny always turns up eventually. But uh, HIT again is making the... the uh, He's getting saturated on every social media post. What a and I always remember that you used to sort of, you were very scathing against him, but you also said, you know, no one got better at anything by doing less of it. And that's kind of been one of my mantras that I've always had over the years. Another thing you also said was like overtraining is largely in the head. And I think that's a fantastic mindset to approach training or life in in general. Do you hold kind of the same sentiment still? And do you think that, you know, like after a, couple of decades of thinking and playing with the concepts do you think we should be doing more or less if we want to get the most out of our training probably not quite menses but more or less uh more certainly more like i like i was saying before everybody should be doing calisthenics every day you should be doing pull-ups push-ups sit-ups something every day walking or running half a mile or a mile and a half every single day that is the base that everybody started with they didn't even fucking talk about because it is literally how you start your day as an athlete because back in the day lifters were athletes and so i think we need to get back in the mindset of being athletes and pursuing athletics in addition to bodybuilding because if you look at nfl players 
They are athletes and they look fucking gorgeous. I mean, you couldn't find better looking physiques, really, uh, like a better looking crew of physiques. You just ask the 49ers to take off their jerseys. You can't find a group of 12 bodybuilders who look better than they do. Yeah, because you've got to remember the guys back at the golden era in Arnold's day, you know, a lot of them were all had other sports going on. So, you know, Robbie Robinson was a sprinter. Uh, Ken Waller was a famous football player. Same with Mike Katz. A lot of these guys, and Franco was a boxer. They all had other uh, arrows to their quiver. And they competed in stuff. They were on the Superstars TV show competing against each other. They did World's Strongest Man. They had these tug-of-war competitions that were super popular back in the day, but we don't have a tug-of-war competition unless it's with children now. Um, But yeah, it was a it was so it was a way different mentality, and they did tons of um of like, uh, bal- like hand balancing stuff. So that with partner assisted stuff, where they're doing those hand, you know, the pictures of people holding each other in handstands and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, that was yeah. huge, and it started in Germany. Actually, you can find pictures in the early eighteen hundreds of people on the beach in Germany doing that shit, and it looks like fucking Muscle Beach. Like they're wearing barely anything, and like. They're just out there fucking partying on the beach, doing handstands and stuff. But now the bodybuilder would never do that because unless it's for the gram, because he might injure himself. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. It. And it's interesting that you you mentioned about competition because, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in my 30 years at the gym is that only the people that seem to compete in something make any kind of progress. The rest are on this treadmill to nowhere, this in- incessant groundhog day. And like they could spend 30 years in the gym and never make progress. Now you sort of said in your writing that you need to expose yourself constantly to the challenge of competition in one form or the other to galvanize your training and nutrition in some kind of effort. So Uh, like just, I did not mean like paying to enter a competition against other people and uh, do that. That's no, I I competed specifically as a fuck you to Steve Shaw and split iron garm. I like, I, it was genuinely because I hate power lifters is why I competed in power lifting. And I just wanted to shit on their sport. Fuck you. I don't even train in this shit. It, you're garbage. The sport's garbage. Fuck everybody. I didn't talk to anybody. I read, but you saw me. I read books. I was nice. You were surprised at how nice I was, as I recall. But uh, yeah, I just would stand around and read a book because it's way better than talking to any of these fucking morons. And uh, like, I don't want to commit a felony today. Thank you. Carry on with your life. <laughs> but uh, it, but and they, they, I, yeah, God, I don't like that sport. But yeah, I just meant like a competition. It There's those friendly competitions that happen in gyms. And that's why I was saying people need to get out of their house, go around other people, be around other people. So you can, even if it's the person you will see out of the corner of your eye and you two are just always in each other's line of sight, always happen to be doing the same exercise at the same time. I don't, maybe it's just me. But I have those competitions with people. Nobody says shit about it. Maybe two years later, you fist bump. Oh, I saw you got 650 the other day or whatever. And then the guy's like, oh, he has been staring at me out of the corner of his eye for the last two years. We all do that shit. But that's why you got to get out of your house and into public. And I'm a guy who works at home. I, I understand it gets weird being around people sometimes. But that's why you have to get around people. We are social creatures. And Aussies and Americans share a very idiotic belief that we all need to be these rugged individuals who can take on any challenge by themselves and we can do everything and fix everything and we don't need cops and we don't need lawyers and I'll handle it myself. It's fucking stupid. The reason why humans have been able to be successful for the last 60,000 years is because we cooperate with each other and communicate with each other. If you do do not communicate and cooperate with other people, you are not a member of the human race. You are some kind of fucking shaved monkey who happens to be talking like us. Uh, but so you need to get out there and see what other people are doing so you can elevate your level to their level. That's what I meant. Interact with other people so you can know where you need to be. And if you thought you were doing the most by doing God, I had some guy the other day be like, a hundred push-ups a day, are you fucking kidding me? And I'm like, nope, I'm not kidding you. Just get down on the ground and start doing fucking push-ups right now. You'll find out how quick it is to get to a hundred. It's not that fucking hard. But people just think that like I'm doing the most. And until you get around other people and find out, no, I'm fucking not. 
oh, like there is a whole different layer of awesome that I can go to. That's when you start expanding your repertoire. It's quite funny you say that as well, because I remember I watched a documentary recently about the golden era and Frank Howard had just been come brought over to from Sardinia by Arnold or from Europe or wherever he was from. And he you know, did kind of prided, he prided himself on being the strongest guy at Gold's Gym at the time. And he, and he looked around and there was guys like Ken Waller that were inclining for more reps than him, powerlifters that were way outlifting him doing it, you know, any of the lifts. And Arnold says, I want to tell you one thing and set yourself straight. Don't ever say that you're the fucking strongest guy in here again because you're not. Yeah. So I, yeah. I thought that was quite, that was from Franco's that was from Franco's mouth himself that he said that. So, you know, that's verified. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Again, like you said, just getting around people and seeing that you are the small fish in the bigger pond yeah and and that's where like these echo chambers that we've kind of gotten into and i'm not talking about political i'm just talking about everything's an echo chamber now if it's bodybuilding if it's powerlifting if it's whatever everybody people or everybody will group together to shit on crossfit entirely incorrectly and it's just the if you start looking around the gym or you go to the gym and start looking around at like oh, well, that guy's got really good calves and he doesn't even lift, so he's just jumping all day long. Maybe I should try jumping. Or like, or you'll see maybe me doing my like legend pull-ups where I'm jumping up and down between pull-up bars and going all fucking crazy on the pull-up bars and be like, oh, well, I want to be wider than I am tall too. Why don't I start doing pull-ups instead of doing deadlifts? You know, it's there are so many options out there, but we, the internet keeps trying to... Well, it's not the internet trying to do anything. The internet is just a tool that people use. But it's like people just keep flocking to a thing and then insisting yeah. that's the only thing. And we silo as And yeah, it's why sorry. all of us have shitty shoulders and shitty pecs now and why everybody's shoulders and pecs are all fucked up. It's because everybody's now thought that we, oh, well, we got to, it's more biomechanically advantageous to bench with an arch, so that must be the way to do it. No, shortening the range of emotion of a lift does not make it better. It makes it worse. You have done less work in the same time. That is arguably and measurably worse. So it doesn't matter how much weight you lifted. You only did two inches of movement. Like, you didn't even flex anything. It, I don't even understand it. But yeah, it's so people just... And they keep shortening stuff and shortening stuff and shortening stuff and claiming it's the same thing. And it's just... When you're doing the splits and you have six inch arms and you're doing a sumo deadlift, you cannot tell me that's the same. Oh, well, your leverages are different. So you don't know. Eat shit. You're just being a bitch. So one thing that is historical that people have been missing out on, and it's part of the reason why I tore my bicep and it's why people have ugly. It's one of the reasons why people have ugly biceps. We stopped training our biceps in a, in a lengthened position. So right. straight arm exercises that are any straight arm exercise we don't do anymore. Like I can't, I cannot lock out my arms still. And I've been working on my right arm, especially for the last two years, because I dislocated both my shoulder and my, uh, and my forearm and did not go to the doctor because I don't have insurance. So I just trained through it. And then my arm was basically on sideways. So, <laughs> but if you do, instead of doing a curl, put, force your arm to a full extension force your shoulder down in the socket and do a front raise. Try that for biceps. It changes okay. your life. And it also pulls your bicep off of your delt and off your pec. So you stop getting, or you start getting rid of this shit in the corner of your pec that like people just throw up their hands and go, oh, well, I'm just old, so I can't fix that. Guess what? I'm fixing it. So maybe make a video of it so we can see it as well on your Instagram or that would, that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You guys would love it if I made a fucking video, wouldn't you? Views. <laughs> I really hate making videos, which is funny that I want to be on TV, but it's mostly just I don't like editing it. I don't know how to light it. I don't know any of the technical side of it, and yeah. I don't ever like the result of it as a, as a result. People, people just like the authenticity of you showing the movement, I guess. You know, they don't need a production a lot, a lot of the time. Have a look at that Sam Sulek kid now. He, he's just, you know, uses a phone camera and he's got 3 million subscribers. So, yeah, he's not at all about the fancy. I don't Sam know if you know select. him. I, 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 I don't follow... Any. Uh, yeah, I know. He's just another one of the bodybuilding kind of industry tra tragedies at the moment. 21-year-old kid. He's roided to the max. He looks like a overinflated. Why would anybody take the advice of a 21-year-old kid about it? Fucking exactly. But, you know, it's, it's <laughs> um, 
sums up this generation perfectly, you know. So and it sums up every generation. Ten years ago was fucking, or fifteen years ago was Ziz. That fucking stupid. Piece. Oh, yeah, I know. Good riddance to him too. But yeah. <laughs> and good riddance to Rich Piana. Let's let's just take a minute to be glad he's fucking dead too. <laughs> Fuck that fucking dickhead. And anybody who uses any of those injectable oils, oh, the, I, I, yeah, I was yeah. I was corrected. It wasn't synthol; it was saline that he used. Who fucking uh, cares? He was a pussy yeah. who probably had a CPAP machine on top of it. Slept like <laughs> one in one hand and a CPAP machine in the other. Fucking bitch. <laughs> well, my next question might seem a little bit contradictory given the nature of our discussion today, but <laughs> at least in your writing, I've noticed a real big shift in the tone of the mindset. You know, compared to say like ten or fifteen years ago. Like your writing and your mindset these days, it seems uh, less overall misanthropic. You're oh, definitely. Really driven, not really <laughs> driven by darkness. And before you used to talk about how you got so much fuel and strength cultivated by, you know, hate. But now you seem to be gravitating toward a mindset that's more positive and oriented towards human connection these days. So what, what exactly has evolved that mindset and what effects has it had on your life and training in general? Have you ever seen the movie Red Dawn from 1984? Yeah. Patrick Swayze? Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 So I really loved that movie growing up. And there was this kid whose parents get killed in it. His name's Robert. And so he just becomes this evil fucking doesn't say shit, just a murder machine. And he's always carving his kills into the butt of his gun. And so Powers Booth looks at him at at one point and he goes... All that hate's gonna eat you up, kid, or gonna burn you up, kid. And he looks at him and goes, "It keeps me warm." I quoted that fucking movie every day, right up until like 2016, when uh, that at that point I had completely destroyed my life, drinking and like was a vicious alcoholic. Had two fucking DUIs. Ended up going to jail for a while, uh, for like 12 months. I didn't even get into an accident. I just, like, they were very strict on DUIs in the place where I got a DUI. So, yeah, nobody was injured. I, it wasn't like I didn't cause any commotion of any kind. It was just I was a drunken dickhead. I needed to be in jail for a little while, I guess. So, and when I got out of there, I was even angrier. Now I hated the government and everybody else. And, uh, yeah, it didn't, it did not work for me. And I was just miserable. I was drunk all the fucking time. And then I wanted to stop being a drunken piece of shit and get back to being my old self. So I'm trying to do that. But at the same time, like just being this hateful bastard at all times was not, it wasn't getting me there. It, it would only get me so far. And then I would get so burned up and so burned out and so mentally exhausted from the amount of energy it takes to be enraged at all times that I would drink myself into a fucking stupor again. And so... I realized that I needed to change everything and I I met my wife actually because we were we were both trying to we were doing charity work for the Caribbean after hurricanes after Hurricane Katrina I think and or not Katrina because it was more recent but in any event it was 2018 so 2020 right before covid we started doing this we started volunteering with with a group that was nearby it was a very like loosely affiliated group where we would just because I switched to weed to get off of drinking. And so we would smoke weed and then we would go deliver food to people who were living in motels. I had a brief stint of motel living and it's like a half step above being homeless. And it is horrendous. I don't know if that is a thing in Australia. They're like really old motels people live in and it's really expensive and it sucks. Do you have that? We have the expensive motels, but yeah, you probably couldn't afford them if you were down and out. So yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Well, this is like they're like flop house motels that people had right. living in for a long period. They're they're like fifty bucks a day. But if you have no money, you're spending all of your fucking money on fifty bucks a day to live in this shithole. So so we would go and deliver hot meals to them from the place that I ended up bouncing for afterwards, the, the weed man joint, and we would deliver like wings and fries to people and just kind of hang out and bullshit with them because. Being in those places, you're really, really isolated and you don't get to talk to many people. And the people you do get to talk to are felons who are on the run from the government or people with drug addictions or whatever. So so having them, giving them the ability to talk to people who weren't trying to get anything from them or fuck them over and just listening to them talk made them really happy and making them happy made me happy. And I realized, shit, all right, so... I'm just going to start smiling because I, I had, you know, stopped smiling altogether. 
so I just I actually had to practice it in the mirror because like you, when you start just walking around smiling it and you haven't smiled for a while you look like a fucking lunatic plus you know I'm covered in muscles and at the time I'm still wearing all this like shit that people mistook for biker uh, like biker wear even though I just like metal so I look like a biker and I'm uh, all covered in muscles and looking angry it does not entice people to talk to you and then you get more in your head well nobody likes me everybody hates me I fucking I should tell myself whatever and um but when you're smiling at people, even when you look like you might be a fucking dangerous maniac, at least you're smiling. And it's a step in the right direction. And then as you go, it it's exactly like I wrote about back in the day. Be positive or you positively suck. Like, if you get into a negative mindset, your whole life goes into the shit. And you can give yourself cancer from thinking negative. So I just kept piling on little positive things, doing nice shit for people. If... If I ever see any person on the street who I can compliment it with a genuine compliment, like something that they're, it's usually like a style thing because I really like fashion. So I, which is something that I always ignored because it wasn't tough and it wasn't cool. And so well, whatever, but which is why I called myself a libertarian. I didn't want to call myself a liberal because liberals are pussies, but I can, I can do it all on my own. So anyway, I, I just kept trying to change that mindset of, negativity because it was leading to negativity in my own life and I found that when I became more positive positive things happened I felt better I physically feel better and you can you can fucking accomplish anything you want to so long as you just keep going but you have to keep going and in the negative mindset you'll just start being like well what the fuck am I doing this for anyway so that's how it, that's how it evolved I'm still angry I'm just trying to be positively angry rather than negatively angry. Are you are you more positive and generally kind of more lighthearted in the gym as well, or do you kind of switch it up and become more of the machine again? Oh no no no! I I've always been a real goof in the gym, but uh, like it's a uh, when you see my videos, it's because I'm getting myself hyped up for it. I don't really I, I'm I've never been a real social person in the gym. Although now I really go out of my way to because you're the big person in the gym. Act like the big man in the gym. Be nice. Fucking say hi to people. It makes people happy. You're the biggest guy in the gym. You say hi to the little guy in the gym who's real timid. It makes him feel comfortable. And so, and that makes the gym a better place. So I've been trying to do that. And I also, I am, I dance a lot in the gym. I, I dance an, a lot in the gym. And I've actually gotten other people in the gym to start dancing. So it, like at times the gym can look like a fucking, one of those like silent raves. Uh, I mean, there's, music playing in the gym but we're all listening to our headphones so we're all doing it in for dance but it's pretty fucking fun it's usually just the women who are dancing but i'm i'm fine with that <laughs> can i can i ask about this and you don't have to answer and you don't have to include it in the podcast but i've never seen um because i remember you had the company with the supplements and the chaos and pain branding and then obviously there was the switch over to plague of strength uh, yeah. You don't have to talk about it, but was there something that kind of went wrong with that uh, deal? Because yeah, I remember you were partnered up with people, and I know it seems that they're still running under that that trade name. And yeah, still apparently selling they the still way. apparently they still tell people I work there, which is yeah, it's strange because uh, yeah, because we have a blood vendetta, and uh, yeah, Wayne has told me he'll sue me if I ever talk about him. But fuck him. Come on and sue me. Open up your books, Wayne. Wayne Wayne has been selling my books illegally for the last several right. years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, I have not made any money off of my books being sold on that website ever. And he stopped. He cut me out in 2018 after my dad had brain cancer. And so when my dad died, he right before he died, he sold his shares of the company to Wayne because I didn't have the money for them. And Wayne artificially devalued the value of the company. So he undercut my dad and gave him bullshit money on the on the shares which my dad then gave to his mistress rather than to my mom which is who he told he was told me he was going to give it to and uh, yeah i was getting fucked over by everybody in 2018 but i was a drunken mess so th these things happen but uh, yeah so i got cut out of the company and i got nothing out of it so but before that happened because i wayne and i didn't get along and i've never really i i he was the dickhead in the gym who everybody fucking hated. So the way I actually met him was all of the big guys in the gym volunteered me to go over and tell him that if he didn't start stripping the weights off his bars after he finished lifting, somebody was going to kill him. And I was like, yeah, I don't care who it is, but somebody's going to hit you with a 45 and you're going to be fucking done. So strip the weights off your fucking bar after you're done deadlifting. Thank you. And that's how we met. And 
Yeah, he he worked for a for-profit college, which is basically the worst kind of snake oil salesman, and I should never have gotten involved with him, but I did not think the company was going to go anywhere. And I had been making supplements for my friends and myself in my kitchen, and I was like, oh, fuck it. Well, this is a way I can pay for myself to write because I've never had a sponsor for lifting. I've never had any kind of sponsor, and so I've just always paid for my own way and paid for everything myself. And I thought maybe the supplements would pay for that. And it ended up not paying. But uh, yeah, so I don't have the money to sue him. So I don't have anything out of it, but I'm sure he's going to send me a letter about it, but well, he can eat shit. He can open up his books and then he'll go to prison. Yeah. The the one thing that's always kind of like, uh, if there is a, if there is a lawyer out there who wants to own a supplement company and wants to take this on and just let me hand you the emails I have and walk away from it, you can have the fucking company. I just want him to be, I want to see his family in generational poverty. Yeah. I mean, sure. down to like great, great grandkids, I want them to be broken penniless. Yeah. I know because like the one thing that's always kind of pissed me off after I've kind of followed you for years and years is you've always had, you're the only one that's really had an original thought out of this whole fucking industry. He and you've read these fantastic- he, up, he sold so many bunk supplements after I left, and I was always like, just sell the good shit. I changed the fucking industry's way to do labels. I was like, let's right. do labels like people do CD covers so that people see it on the shelf and say, that's fucking metal, let's do that. And now everybody else does it, but it just- I, I used to buy it, you know, uh, back in the day when it first came out, you know, the-, the cat Fucking paying shipping to Australia, God bless you, sir. Exactly, all the merch, all the t-shirts, but- you know, like if there's one person that deserves some kind of fucking payday in this industry, it's you, man. Because like, it's like when I made that video a few months ago, like I didn't get your permission. I didn't talk. I just sort of thought he's the one guy that's the only one that have a fucking original idea in the whole 20 years of this industry or 30 years of this industry that I've been involved in. Everyone piggybacks and leaps off and fucking steals your ideas and then push, publishes them as your own. And it seems that everyone else is getting rich off of your shit. And you don't seem to get anything from it. Now I make about I make about fifty dollars a day. Yeah, well, you know, I, look at yeah, I I, I, eat, small, I eat white rice for breakfast now. I can't even afford protein powder. It's pretty. I I mean, I'd like to say that I am some kind of success story, but I mean, I did make a successful supplement company, but uh, and I did get on TV. But in terms of monetary success, it looks like I'm on the Harlan Sanders path of maybe at sixty two I'll get rich. So I'm hoping for that. I mean, he made yeah. it at 62. So I got I got another 15 years to go. And I remember when back in the day, he used to do that podcast with that scumbag Paul fucking Carter. And, and I look oh, at him now, oh, and he's, that, like, he's, he's got a fucking car, a sports car for every day of the week from selling fucking bastardized versions of Mike Mensah programs online, you know? And Plus, it's just that right. dude, you want to talk about a man who blew up his life. Wait, except it, yeah. I made an actual face turn and I was like, all right, I've been a negative piece of shit. I can, double I can do this. I can motivate people in a bet. Yeah, he just went worse. He was like, well, I used to be in an open relationship, but I fucked that up. Uh, and so now I'm a Christian psychopath who hates it, who is promoting anti-vax. Anybody, uh, you can have whatever belief you want to have. I don't care how fucking dumb you are. You could fail science as long as you want. Keep your dumb fucking mouth shut anybody who is in the fitness industry and is promoting something that is going to hurt people should not be allowed to do so and i'm not the gatekeeper of the industry that i wish i could be but if i could do the jay and silent bob thing go through the phone book fly to people's houses and fuck them up you can rest assured there'd be a lot less people on fucking instagram because <laughs> these people should not be opening their mouths in public they don't have the right so I've known, well, I've, I've known Eric Bugenhagen a little bit, like since I was the first person to get him on social media. We, we were the first people to sponsor him at Chaos and Pain. And he seems like a nice guy, but he needs to stop with the insulin and getting kids to start doing insulin. I mean, these kids are doing an amount of drugs that blows my mind. Like, so I, I have not used any steroids in over a year and like over yeah, not a year. I really and I, I've years. never been real big on them. But when I did, yeah, yeah. And people think that it's magical, but by the same, so they think that any amount of testosterone is magical, but then they don't just take test. They're taking DNP of all fucking things, test 
primo i've done uh, like uh, stuff i've never heard of and uh, they're all taking gh every last kid on earth is now taking gh like it's a fucking healthy thing to do the shit like you're giving yourself acromegaly and when you're taking insulin you're giving yourself diabetes like there is no amount of having big biceps that like having diabetes it makes it worth it you're gonna lose your feet yeah like, yeah they see Flex Wheeler and Ronnie Coleman in fucking wheelchairs, and they're still like, oh, yeah, baby, live that lightweight. And it's like, he's in a fucking wheelchair. Like, and that's not from lifting weights. It's from drugs. And every other week, we have another lifter now that's dying in their 40s or early 50s. Last week, we lost somebody called Sean Davis. He was big kind of during the Dorian bad days. So, you know, just another one by uh, Sadat. He was a Dorian training partner, right? He was peripheral to Dory, and he came a little bit after, but he was still in that British scene of lifting. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 But, and meanwhile, Dave Palumbo is still somehow alive. Oh, fuck. I know. That, that... <laughs> How is that? Exactly. I mean, he, he looks like a goddamn an alien, doesn't he? He uh, looks like a fucking alien. For someone to have a physique malady named after him, and people still follow this fucking idiot's advice, just shows you the level of the lack of brain cells we're dealing with in this industry. Yeah. People still hire him as a coach. He's making millions of dollars. I, I mean, I can tell you, I, I read it in a, in a, a 19th century book uh, recently, and I can tell you why I make no money. Because they knew in the 19th century, you, if, you were a, if you're a very good lifter, you hire another person who knows nothing about training to write a very easy program and charge too much for it. I charge yeah. too little for my programs and they're too fucking hard. And my books are written on a level that those fucking idiots can't read. So at, at the end of the day, it's my fault, but I'm getting there. I'm trying at least. <laughs> I, really what I'm trying to do is keep kids from hurting themselves and show people you don't need to be neurotic about lifting. <laughs> like I just saw a video of Tom Platts where he's like, I don't even know why people are bodybuilders now. I used to fuck girls and go to parties and eat food and I never deprived myself. I had fun every fucking day I was a bodybuilder and I made money at it. And now these people are poor, they're sick, they're pathetic, they can't do anything, and they're miserable. It's disgraceful. So I'm just trying to show people, like, this is supposed to be fucking fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember Tom Platt's one sort of saying that the, the worst thing in his life is that he would only ever be known just for bodybuilding. Like, he wanted that multidimensionality. And as you sort of say, the best lifters, the best people that approach this game are the true artists, the people that are invent, create, synthesize, you know, like yourself and what you've been doing and what you stand for for the past, you know, 15 years. And I just also want to encourage people, you know, that are watching this podcast because you have been requested to come on my channel. Fucking go out. Thank and, you to everybody who's requested it. And buy the materials that fucking Jamie's put out there because if you do not check out his books, you are missing fucking huge pieces of the puzzle. And you are, will be spinning your wheels for years, getting nowhere. Like, you know, like I said, I'm on the, I'm knocking on the door of 50 and thanks to your writings, your mindset, your diets, I'm still where I'm at and fucking hanging in there. I can still dip 80 kilos around my waist and yes. no problem. You know, I, I'm fucking as strong as I ever was. I'm healthy as I ever was, you know, and I fucking still look great. I, you know, but no, I'm just happy that I found your work basically, you know, so you, you asked me which people I don't like in the industry. You're one of the few fucking people that I can count on my, you know, two or three fingers that I will always open my wallet with no matter how fucking broke I am. <laughs> I really appreciate that. It's a wide shop, man. To that end, what you were saying is, uh, so you, you look at these modern guys and they are done lifting early. Like Dave Tate and Jim Wendler don't even fucking lift, do they? Like, yeah. whereas Charles Poir... When I gave you his measurements when he was 32. When he was 44, his biceps were bigger and his waist was smaller. And this was, he was born in 1866. Your life expectancy was like 40 in 1866. And he lived in 1935. Like, and, and people today are living to 40 and their life expectancy is 75. And they don't even look good when they fucking die either. It's only, they only look good with a filter on with, lighting right and with this done and with that done and it's just like if you look at the old school guys like warren lincoln travis was 
he was a big fat fuck, but and he did a lot of like harness lifting. He was one of those circus lifters I generally don't care about. But he died at the age of 62, which was one of the youngest people I could find from that era who, who died young. But he died of cocaine while doing a 3,000 pound harness lift at the age of 62 in front of a bunch of people for his sixth performance of the day or whatever. Like, all right, yeah, sometimes your heart's going to pop. Cocaine's a hell of a drug or it was meth or whatever. But I mean, he was still, per he was an active performer. And you look at the guys in in early Russia and they were performing like a, the Grigory Novak that everybody sends the video around of him flipping kettlebells. That guy was one of the earliest Olympic weightlifting champions for, uh, for Russia. And uh, he ended up getting, his career ended up getting fucked because he got into a fist fight with another guy on the team and that guy got sent to the gulags like they tore down a city fighting but so he had to go into the siberian circus which is why he started throwing those kettlebells around but they did that for fun as a warm-up and then he took it to the circus and people started freaking out like because they're watching him do a warm-up but that guy performed into his 70s he lived Incredible. through he lived through the 1904 revolution the 1919 revolution the fucking Ukrainian famines, the like the Soviets, everything, nothing could kill this motherfucker. And there was another guy on that team who Soviet scientists used to go out and study because he lived into his 70s, even though they specifically tried to kill him by si uh, by exiling to Siberia with no coat. He just got off the train and started lifting. Got those Rasputin genes. Man, it's just it's it's just people have it in their heads that they're going to be weak and and in pain and they can't do things and so they don't do things and when things do start hurting they stop doing them and i'm guilty of that as as much as anybody else which is why i can't lock out my arms still but i'm getting there because now i'm forcing myself to go through that pain and yeah there's a lot of pain and chaos and pain these days <laughs> i'm really conscious of your time and i i just i would love to have you back on again because this conversation could spawn a thousand more and i think you know after this people would probably want to see more i especially would love to ask more but i would love to come uh, back on i didn't realize yeah, we'd gone two hours look at us jeez yeah <laughs> knowing what Time you, knowing, <laughs> knowing what you know now you know as the ad, advanced in years lifter what would a young jamie lewis do differently if you were just starting your training again on day from day one i would i would do the thing that i told you early on i would tell myself yo Six days a week, keep it to light the, the shit you can do at home. Light dumbbells, uh, kettlebells, body weight stuff. Do 100 pull-ups every day. Do 300 sit-ups every day. Do 300 push-ups every day. As, that's a day off. Is just That's your lowest day. That is a rainy day. You got the flu. You don't feel like doing shit. Ah, well, you're still going to do a little something. Do some squats. Also, also, one big thing. Squatting on your toe. Free squats. Squatting on your toes is huge. And being able to do a third world squat changed my fucking life. And I don't ever, I know I've said it twice and this, the first time was facetious. This is time is for real. I make myself squat to pet any animal or to talk to a small child. I squat as long as that animal or child wants me to squat. I sit down there and it was so fucking hard at first because I couldn't even get my ass to that position. And I was in so much pain and my legs were shaking and I felt like a fucking dickhead but I did it. And now I can actually do a squat the way the old school, like Charles Poivre would, would have done it, which is with your heels together and your feet at 90 degree angles from each other. And you keep your body totally upright and then squat down to your ass touches your heels. Totally different style of squat, but being able to squat up on your toes will stretch out your feet and get rid of all of the fucking calf and ankle and shin problems that fat old white people tend to get. I'm going to start trying it. Oh, can you, uh, can you do a third world squat? Uh, not that, I, not that I know of, but I'm going to start trying. And, uh, I really it. recommend it. You, you're going to feel like an ass at first, but just do it for animals at first. Like give yourself a reason to do it and then you'll do it. You don't need to like go and start doing squats. I don't think it's really necessary. One day I counted how many times I squatted for my animals. Cause I was just putting pennies on a, on a shelf and it was over a dollar. So you get a hundred right. squats in. I mean, if you like animals, you get a hundred squats in a day, just petting animals. Yeah, I see. Well, I thank you once again for your time and uh, your generosity in coming on and, and speaking to us. 
once again, I implore everybody to check out the links in the description. Go and buy one, if not more, of Jamie's books and the resources. You'll be doing yourself a favor. You're training a favor. And I What's, guarantee... What is your favorite one of my books? Because I know my favorite is 365. 365 Days of Brutality is my absolute favorite book that I've written because it's the books that I grew up reading where it's just a bunch of different lifters. You get to read a bio so you find out why this person is in the book. You see the picture, he looks awesome, and then or she looks awesome, and then you get to do their workout. So it's like you can kind of cherry pick different workouts from different lifters from different different strength sports. What which is yeah, obviously with me it has to be you know the originals, the three issuance of a sanity, insanity trilogy, because I have always sort of thought if you were to buy any collection of books, that could be your bible, and you wouldn't really need to read much more beyond that. I and will I say, back, no, see, there's a lot of language used in those that I wish that I hadn't. I was I, real busy trying to be tough, at, like trying to like look like I, because I just, I was like, I don't fucking care. Like, you want to fight me over what I wrote? Fucking fight me. I'm trying to fight everybody. I really was of, trying to fight everybody. It's part of the appeal, though. It makes the, it makes the information digestible and interesting. And it's like, the people that will pick up those books are of that age generally and that mindset. So, you know, you captured if me you when I was- If you want information to be punched into your fucking skull, then buy those three books. I, I exactly. literally punch it into your temples. And I've gone back again and again and again over the years, highlighted, made notes, etc. Because I was going to make, you know, a, a very detailed videos about the books, but I sort of thought, how am I going to find video to make, you know, videos about this? But every time I read it, I get something new. And I think that's the uh, the hallmark of a really good book, and in this in this case, a trilogy of books. But again, you know, like every time every time I pick up a new book, like the Famine and Feast of Ferocity has totally revamped the way I've eaten. The bite size history, you know, just adds to my general collective knowledge because I'm a massive physical culture history nerd. You know, so there's always more to learn. There always is, and. Well, that's awesome. I'm so glad you love Bite Size History, dude. I love that book. And it didn't, it doesn't sell as well as I wish it did, but it doesn't have any programs in it. So, yeah, well, I was on your nuts again, your Instagram a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, you're going to release part two. And you're like, hey, I'm a fucking one man army over here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was you asking me. But yeah, I am. My wife was like, so are you going to get this book out this weekend? And I'm like, I am literally so tired of making f fucking content. Like I just, cause I, nobody has created content at the rate that I have. I have got to be the most prolific author in the history of uh, 100%. So, yeah. And now I'm doing fucking writing and video editing and I am just tapped out. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, if people don't like reading that they should check out your podcast, which is the prize fighters and badasses podcast that you do with your partner, because prize that's a circus freaks and gangsters. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Fuck. Oh, no, it's totally <laughs> My mind starting to fall in on itself at night. I'm, I'm more of a morning person, but yeah, exactly. And I love how you kind of tie it to some pop culture, you know, films, etc., as well, which makes it a little bit more palatable to the people that have already seen the films as well. Yeah. I, so the the concept of that, real quick, because I know you're fading. I can actually see your eyelids closing. But it's only. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like nine thirty there now. You're dying. I wouldn't mind running out. <laughs> I went to nine. I went to bed at nine last night, so I would be like up at five and like ready to talk at six thirty. But <laughs> yeah, so so we watch like uh, films and TV shows that are set in the nineteenth century, and then we talk about the historicity of them so that we can teach the history that way. Because it's way easier for me to talk about the movie The Gangs of New York, so you can see the movie, you can like kind of get the feel of it, and you can get your fingers into it a little bit. I actually said it the other day, though, like, we're like getting our fingers into the guts, our hands and digging our hands in the guts of history so we can, like, do divination about the future for it. And so you can kind of see where America's going oh, from where we've come from. And you can understand the lifestyles, the lifters you're reading about a little bit better because you can understand the environment that they came up in. So and I, we're going to do some Australia, too, because Ned Kelly is amazing. That story is yeah. fun. You guys have some amazing fun. Yeah, yeah, villain in, in Australian history. I can't believe even Sandow made his way down here to do a show back in the day. Like, imagine the fucking rigmarole of having to travel all the way down here to do a show. I can't find any photos or videos of it. I don't know. Oh, Sandow, Sandow went to Australia. Correct, and so did Houdini. Houdini flew like a plane down here, apparently. 
Huh. Yeah. Well, I'll be there. I mean, at least Houdini could get on a plane. Dan Sandow, I don't think, he didn't live long enough to really have commercial flights to Australia. No, no. So, yeah, I thought that was an interesting fact. But I've never been able there to turn up any photos. a lot of wrestlers yeah. back in the day who traveled to, uh, to Australia as well. Like like I said, yeah. Clarence Whistler, Whistler was one of the best wrestlers in America. And, and yeah, died eating shit. And we have our own physical culture icons as well, you know. And, yeah, you never know what you'll turn up in this country. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, I thank you again. I'll, I'll let you go. And uh, I hope we can do it again soon sometime. It's been a great honor to have you on. Absolutely. I've had so much fun. I really appreciate you having me and I and I can't wait to do another one. Awesome. Thank you very much again, Jamie. Have a great one. Thanks, you too.